Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. How's everybody doing today? Amen. Amen. Oh, the glory of the Lord is in this place. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is on the move all the time. He is on the move all the time. And we are required to move with him. Amen. We are required to imitate him. We're required to walk with him. We are required to be as he was here on this earth. We must be the perfect love of God. Always. Does everybody understand what that means? No matter how you feel, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, offenses, persecutions, frustrations, pains cannot dictate the way we treat each other. Does everybody understand that? That is the perfect love of the Father. Jesus suffered so much, and no matter what they did to him, no matter how much they beat him, no matter how much they bruised him, spit on him, slandered him, he showed the perfect love of the Father. And that is our call. That is what we are to do. The time that we're in right now, you know pastors talked about the 90 days and the fire and everything. It is a time of purifying and sanctifying. It is a time for us to be getting purified and sanctified, set apart for the master's plan. We must constantly seek exposure and conviction in this time. We cannot move forward without receiving the exposure and conviction that the Lord is bringing upon us in this time. Because you will get left behind. You will not fulfill the call of the Lord. You will not be in position to bring rescue. You will not be in position for the great harvest. You will not fulfill the call of the Lord if you are not taking heed to the conviction and exposure that he is bringing in this time. Who cares if it hurts? Who cares if it burns? Who cares if it's making you tired and it's making you stressed and you're going through it? Go through it. Die to yourself. Shut up. Receive the exposure, the conviction, and do something about it. Put it to practice what he reveals to you in this time. You're not the only one going through it. And I promise you there's somebody going through it worse than you. That's a guarantee. Amen? <clears throat> So in this, um, you got to kind of take it back to the beginning. You know, all of us have got to start somewhere. We've got to start off of a foundation. You know, I work, um, I work construction, and a lot of the jobs that we do, they are complete brand new water plants that are built from the ground up. I should say from the underground up. So it starts off with the soil, then it starts off with a foundation, and then it starts off, and then it goes to walls being built, so on and so forth. They do not start pouring walls that are 20 foot high until the foundation is complete. You do not start building the house until the foundation is complete and solid. Does everybody understand that? And you do not build your foundation on yourself, on what you think you need. You build it on the rock. You build it on Christ. You build it on the Father. And in reality, he's the one building it. You submit, he builds. Amen? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. You need this. You need that. You should have this. You deserve that. Tell him to shut up and get behind you. You need Jesus. That's what you need. I need Jesus. I, we can't do it without them. It's impossible. First Corinthians three, we're going nine through sixteen. <clears throat> Everybody there? Hallelujah. It says, "For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field." You were God's building. 
according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Does everybody, does everybody grab that? It's plain as day, clear. Your foundation must be established on Jesus Christ. Without it, you're going to fall. And this is something that people lose sight of. They hear it over and over and over and over and over again, but yet we still allow things to come in and crack our foundation. We still allow things that we desire, things that we crave, things that we want, family members, friends, things of the world, to bring cracks and destruction on the foundation that God has put for us. It's got to stop. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which, has, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? I don't know how much more clear it can get. You build on him, you're going to prosper, grow. He's going to bless your socks off. You build on yourself, you're going through the fire. It's all going to burn. It's all going to get destroyed. You're going to lose it all. We should all go home now. <laughs> do what he says and live. Don't do what he says and die. It can't get any more simple. It is a simple process of denying yourself the things that you want. You already know they're going to kill you. You already know they're going to cause you to lose everything. They're going to cause you to lose the greatest thing, your relationship with him the love of the Father, your love for him, his love for you, you touching him, him touching you. That is the greatest loss you can ever suffer. Let's go to Psalms 127. <clears throat> so on this road of him breaking us down and bringing us to a place where we submit to him and allow him to build our foundation, you know, we were talking about the enemy and how stupid he is and tries to bring in nonsense to sway you and to pull you off course and to bring destruction on the foundation that the Lord's trying to set up for you and the house that he's trying to build for you. That will never crumble if you allow him to build it. So in this time of the foundation that he's building in us, there's going to be temptation. There's going to be things that you're going to have desires for. You're, I mean, you know, we've all got family. We've got kids. We've got bills. We've got things that we've got to take care of. But when your foundation's built on him, you know all that stuff's going to work out. You're not concerned about that. You're not concerned about how quick you get a vehicle. You're not concerned about how quick you get a job. You're not concerned about how quick you get your kids back or your family back or whatever. You wait until he has established a true solid foundation, and then you allow him to bring. You allow him to feed you. You allow him to develop you and to give you the things that you are ready for. A foundation cannot stand on a house that is built too big for the foundation. Does everybody understand that? God has given you a predestined foundation at an appointed time. And if you put too much on that foundation, it's going to crack, it's going to split, and the house is going to fall. Does everybody understand that? Does that, make, does that make sense? In construction, there is there are engineers and all kinds of people that they plan exactly the amount of concrete that has to be poured for that foundation. They know exactly how much the walls are going to weigh. They know everything, in and out, what that foundation will handle. God knows what you can handle. He will only give you what you can handle. So wait on him, trust in him, and let him bring it. Be anxious for nothing. Seek him first, and he will add everything to you. Where is it to go? Psalm 127. Psalm 127, 1. 
Very simple. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build on it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Amen. <clears throat> so, you know, as I was working on all this stuff, um, the Lord was showing me some things. And night before last, I had a dream. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> it was crazy. I was kind of blown away when I got up. So I'm, I'm at this place, and I'm walking up to this house. And I can see it looks like a construction site. You know, there's a fence around it. There's a big um, excavator. And I go around the back side of the house, and there is this massive, massive crater dug. Like, and it's going up underneath the house. And so I woke up in the morning, and I was like, what the heck was that, Lord? Like, what was that all about? <clears throat> and the Lord said, you cannot try and repair the foundation from going underneath and adding to it. Sometimes we've got to start all over. You've got to count your losses, get back in position with him, repent, cut loose from everything, and get repositioned. That goes, you know, there's a lot of people, they, they leave this place and then they come back, and they go through the same process they went through before. The same exact process spiritually, the same exact process physically. And they don't grab a hold of it. They do the same thing. A lot of them don't want to let go of the things they have, vehicles, jobs, wives, whatever. They don't completely trust that God is going to do a new thing in them. So whatever you learned before, cut it off. Start over fresh. Let him build a foundation that's going to stand and is going to last. Let him build the house. Let him bring the stuff you need. Let him fulfill you in every area of your life. And stop trying to grab a hold of things on your own. There are too many people falling off because of cracked foundations. There are too many people losing sight of what he's done in their lives because of cracked foundations. Let him build it. So in this... The main key to cracks in your foundation and your house crumbling and falling are open doors. So we're going to talk today about exposing open doors. Hatred, contention, offense, bitterness, disobedience, false agreements, backbiting, and slander will cause your foundation to crumble. It doesn't matter how much you do for the kingdom, you can still be out of order. You can serve the kingdom, you can sow in the kingdom, you can work your butt off for the kingdom of God, but if you harbor these things, you are out of order. And it's all for nothing. There will be no reward for you. Practice lawlessness, you do not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? That's, that's the bottom line. So it is critical in these times that we search these things through. Because you can be confused and think that because I'm doing all this stuff, I'm going to church three times a week, I serve the ministry, I do all this, I do all that, that you're good. It doesn't matter how much you do. If you're not searching yourself through and allowing God to expose the impurities in your life and then doing something about it. I'm going to say that again. Exposing the impurities in your life and then doing something about it. Turning from them and going the other direction. Everything you're doing is for nothing. Does everybody understand? Works will not save you. We must be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. And that means putting the things we learn, putting the things he shows us to practice. It's very simple. Very, very simple. The problem is we just don't do it. People choose to do evil. They choose to agree with their feelings. They choose to be bitter. They choose to be offended. They choose to be angry. They choose to lash out at people. That is not the character of Christ. And if you truly love the Lord with all your heart, you will seek him with everything that's within you and go to him and say, Father, I'm sorry. I am sorry for those things that I've agreed with, Lord. Please show me what is displeasing to you. 
so that I can make moves. And this isn't an area where you drive yourself nuts. You present yourself to him as a willing vessel. You lay down your life and you say, Lord, I'm yours. What do you want me to do? And then here's something just crazy. When he tells you what to do, you do it. I, I, it's as simple as that. He tells you what to do, you do it. And his voice may come from spiritual authority in your life. It may come from pastor. It may come from Kate. It may come from Carlin or David. It may come from somebody else, Mom Maureen or myself or from my wife or from, from Vivian or from somebody in the office. It may come from somebody in authority and position. You may not like it. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you cannot submit to your spiritual authority, you cannot submit to God. And you're, you are fooling yourself if you think you're submitting to God when you're not submitting to your spiritual authority. You don't like your house manager? I don't care. He is your God-appointed authority. She is your God-appointed authority. They got to work out their own salvation too, but you got to make sure and be obedient and do what you're supposed to do because you're going to reap for your actions. Amen? Joshua 1. I love this. This is something that is so cool. It, this, it's so, this, some of the simplest stuff will take you so deep into the kingdom of God, it'll blow your mind. If you don't do the will of God, you don't get the will of God. Does everybody understand that? It's simple. There are righteous requirements for each one of us to fulfill. If you don't want to do them, you don't get the benefits of the kingdom. It's plain and simple. He's got so much for us. So much love to give. And it's not even about money or cars or homes. The perfect love of God is uncomprehendable to people. It is the most glorious, the most blessed, the most blessedest thing you could ever encounter in your entire life. Who cares about the money? Who cares about the cars? Who cares about the homes? Who cares about anything? In his presence is fullness of joy, peace, joy, and righteousness in his spirit, and perfect love that fulfills everything. That is what we're after here. That is what we must have. And if you're not willing to do whatever it takes, don't grumble and complain why you don't have it. The reason you don't have peace is because you don't fight for it. The reason you don't have a fulfilled and loved, uh, full of love heart is because you don't fight for it. You don't go after him. He wants to give it to you, but you've got to be positioned for him to give it to you. Joshua 1. Joshua 1, 1 through 9. <clears throat> Everybody there? All right. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. So there is a promise. God has got a blessing for them. He's got a blessing for Joshua. He's got a blessing for the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to, your, to their fathers to give them. Now here is the cooperation part. Only, he says, 
Be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law, the Bible, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you do not do the will of God, you do not get the will of God. Everybody needs to write this down. This is simple and critical. He speaks. We obey. He moves. As simple as can be. He speaks. We obey. He moves. I was listening to a teaching a long time ago, and it was, it's something that really hit me, and it stuck with me all these years. And the guy said, the problem isn't that people don't hear from God. The problem is they don't obey him. They don't do what he says. And eventually, you're going to stop hearing from God. So we need to write this down, too. He speaks. We disobey. He pulls away. Does everybody understand that? If you can grab a hold of that simple little thing right there, the power of God will fill your life, overwhelm you with perfect love, with peace, joy, and righteousness, and with every spiritual blessing. Obedience is the key to keeping the enemy out. You want the doors closed in your life? Do what God tells you to do. Do what your appointed authority tells you to do with no grumbling or complaining, no asking questions, no crying to your brothers and sisters. No going over here and talking about this person or that person or what this person or that person's doing. Shut up. Die to yourself. Do what he says and love him and bless him. And if somebody hurts you or offends you, forgive them, bless them, sever the emotional attachment, keep them moving. Because you've got to work out your salvation. What they do, you're not accountable for. You're accountable for what you do. So if you hold stuff in your heart towards anybody, you're accountable for that. You cannot go before the throne room of God and say, but such and such did this to me. So that's why I did this. That's why I left the program. That's why I left the ministry. Because they did this. God's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You practiced lawlessness. I told you to work out your salvation. I told you to forgive and bless them and sever the emotional attachment and put your big boy and girl pants on and keep it moving and fight for my kingdom. They'll hold account after you're out of the line. Amen? Let him do his work and you just do what he tells you to do. Amen? And this, this, is, this is critical here. The decisions we make cause ripple effects in eternity. They will either lead to life or death. There are people out there globally that are counting on our worship, warfare, and prayers. Staying in position is critical, not only for us, but for people all over the world as well. And do you not know or understand? There are probably thousands. I don't know the number, hundreds, maybe thousands, that each one of us, God has appointed for us to be a part of their life somehow. There may be people in Egypt or or Israel, or, or Asia, or somewhere off there that we'll never see or meet. But you're coming to this place and worshiping your heart out to touch the Father. Your prayer life behind closed doors, your prayer life in, in, the, in the guys' houses, in the girls' houses, your prayer life everywhere, your worship life everywhere, it brings destruction on the kingdom of Satan. It opens windows of opportunity for the lost to be rescued. You're standing here in Okoe, Florida, in the back of a thrift store. But what you're doing here is touching lives all over the world. We have got to grab a hold of that. That has got to be a reality to each and every one of us. That has got to be real to you. It has got to fill your spirit, soul, and body knowing that everything you do is for the kingdom of God. 
And if you don't do it, you will have an account for it when you get before the Father. I do not want to be the one that goes before him and he says, man, there was like a thousand people that didn't make it home because you chose to do what you wanted to do. A thousand people that now are not in the kingdom of heaven because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I don't want to go before the Lord and hear that. None of us should want to go before the Lord and hear a thousand people, a hundred people, one person didn't make it home because I did what I wanted to do instead of what God told me to do. It's got to be serious. It's got to be taken serious. We cannot play games. Time is running out. And this is the time where things are busting loose big time. You know, Pastor has talked about the early and latter rain, the, the, the outpouring of his spirit, the great harvest. We know all this stuff is it's right on the brink of happening. And this is the time and season that if we are not purified and sanctified and righteous and holy in the Lord's sight, we're going to miss out on what he has for us to do. And that is unacceptable. Unacceptable for us. We've got to button down, put our big girl and big boy pants on, and kick the devil's butt. And stop getting so stinking offended and in your feelings and falling off and doing things you know God's not telling you to do. Job 2. <laughs> So we see here that disobedience is a big open door to the enemy. Another major open door to the enemy is grumbling and complaining. Everybody always thinks they got it so stinking bad. So let's go to Job 2. Verse 1. Everybody there? And again, there was a day. Now let me just give you a little background. So the previous chapter, Job just lost everything he had. His kids got killed. All, all kinds of people in his life got killed. They're all dead now. His children, his livestock's gone. Everything's gone. So now, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause, so Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face." And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Now, can you imagine what would be coming out of your mouths right now, having just lost your children, having just lost all your finances, having just lost everything? Now, from head to toe, you're struck with painful, agonizing boils. I'm not even going to ask you what you'd be saying because I don't want to have to call anybody a liar. <clears throat> I know what I'd be saying. <clears throat> Verse, where are we at? Verse 8. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> this is hilarious. But he said to her, you speak of one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. That is powerful, powerful to love God more than anything in this world, to know that even when hardship comes, you bless him. You bless him, you bless him, you bless him, and you stay a blessing to people around you. No matter what, that is what we are called to do to be a blessing to those that are around us. Not grumbling, complaining, not telling everybody bad things about this person or what happened to you or making people feel sorry for you or pity you, any of that stuff. Kick the devil's butt. Continue to fight the good fight of faith. And don't allow anything the enemy brings on you 
to bring you to a place of grumbling and complaining and sowing in the flesh. <clears throat> grumbling and complaining will kill you. What you speak will either bring you life or death. We cannot lose sight of how minute our circumstances truly are. Stop letting the enemy blow up your struggle. The struggle is only as real and as big as you allow it to be. And that goes for everything. Stop trying to make people feel sorry for you and pity you. That's a spirit, just so you know. That is a spirit. The woe is me spirit. Feel sorry for me. I have such a hard time. Things are going so bad for me. Kick the devil's butt. Come out and kick the devil's butt. Tell him to go. Take dominion and authority over your life. That is your right. That is your God-given authority, your power, your right to kick the devil's butt. To stay in dominion and authority and not allow the enemy to bring you to a place where you're in the woes as measies. Because I'm telling you right now what our boy Job went through and what our father Jesus went through. You've got no right to grumble and complain about your circumstances. If you ever get to a place where you're feeling down on yourself and, and weary and you think things are just not good for you, go pray in the Spirit for a little bit and then sit down and watch the Passion of Christ. And then repent. Because what he went through for us is death-defying. I couldn't imagine it. Can you imagine being scourged? and whipped and beaten. You've got lashes that are just pouring out blood all over. You can barely stand up. You've got a crown of thorns on your head. You've been spit on. You've been punched. You've been beaten. And I don't know, you know what those, those whips they use? They have little pieces of metal or glass shards or something in them, and they just were going at him. They broke his legs. They nailed him to a cross. How can you complain about your circumstances? Look to your Father in heaven in your times of need and the hard times when you feel down, when you feel out, when you feel lost. Look to him. Thank him for your freedom. Thank him for what he's done for you. Thank him that you're not dead because almost every last one of us in this room should be dead. I know I should be dead. I should be in prison for the rest of my life. God has made a way of escape for me to be here on this earth still and to know freedom, to know true freedom and peace. I was a commiserator of all things. If you were around me, you were miserable. I made you miserable because I was either going to beat the crap out of you or I was going to rob you and then beat the crap out of you. And then I was going to come back the next day and do it again. Evil and wicked is who I was. The things that I did, the things that the Lord rescued me from, I can't help but get down on my knees and say, thank you, Lord. And I'm sure that I am not alone in this place in that, in that area. I know that. I know that a lot of people in here have got some past behind them that is not pretty. So don't lose sight of what he's done on the cross and in your life. Amen? It is critical, man. This stuff has got to be taken serious. It has got to be taken serious. We've got to start putting this stuff to practice and doing what he says. The enemy is not playing games. He is killing, he is stealing, he is destroying. And we're allowing it. Stop being a victim. And take dominion. Matthew <clears throat> this is something that you, know, you may want to write down. We must keep the enemy in a position of having no power over us, not the other way around. We must keep the enemy in a position of having no power over us, not the other way around. <clears throat> and how do you do that? by knowing who you are in the King of Kings. Maintaining your identity in Christ. If you don't know who you are, the devil knows that you don't know who you are, 
and he's going to take you for everything. <clears throat> Jesus is the coolest and greatest example that we can ever have. Bottom line. He is and was everything that we are supposed to be, everything that we are supposed to strive to be. We must imitate him in everything, and that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but we strive for perfection. Matthew 4, 1. Is everybody there? <clears throat> then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to... To, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus stood on the word. Nothing was going to move him or sway him out of position. He believed the word. He knew the word. He stood on the word. And he kicked butt with the word. And let me see here. Five. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written, again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on, the, on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And their glory. And he said to him, All things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So in this, identity can be a major open door. Amen. Like I said before, if you don't know who you are, the devil knows you don't know who you are, and he is going to come in, and he is going to take you over. Jesus always stood on the word of God. He always trusted the word of God, and no matter how he felt or what he went through, he lived the word of God. No matter what you go through, no matter how you feel, you must live the word of God. And if you go through it, you decree and declare the word, you stand on the truth, you stand on the Father, peace will come. It's a promise. Peace will come. But it takes a fight. And if you're not willing to fight, you better get repositioned. If you're looking for a quick goosebump feeling or a, a quick fix or any of that stuff, you're in the wrong place. This is a marathon. And God is constantly working. He's constantly pruning. We're constantly going through the fire so that we can be exposed and purified for his glory. Kick the devil's butt. Do not surrender and submit to the enemy. Surrender and submit to the will and word of God, and peace will come. Ministering to you, to your spirit will come. Amen. Uh, 2 Kings 5 2, 520. <clears throat> so we know that disobedience is an open door to the enemy. We know that grumbling, complaining is an open door to the enemy. We know that loss of identity is an open door to the enemy. <clears throat> Isolation is another critical open door to the enemy. And when we talk about isolation, you know, I know that it, it's about, um, you know, not being around like-minded people, but it's also about isolating yourself from anything that will take you out from underneath the protection of God. So, Isolation is anything that takes you out from under God's covering and gives, you, and gives the enemy an open door to access you. 
Now, that's not like a Webster's Dictionary version of, of the meaning. This is a spirit-filled version. I'm not saying that being away from everybody is not going to open the door to the enemy. It is. If you're not assembling, you're not fellowshipping, you're not staying connected with like-minded believers, that is an area where the enemy's going to get you off course. But there are multiple ways that you can isolate yourself and get yourself to a place where you're out from underneath the covering of the Lord and open to the enemy's attack. You can come to church three times a week and be around everybody, but still be in agreement with things in your life that bring you into an isolated place where the enemy can attack you and where the enemy can grab a hold of you. And that's, that's what we're talking about. So we're going to go to 2 Kings 5.20. <clears throat> This guy was an idiot. Gehazi. Everybody there? But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. Who told him that? That was a, a powerful act of God in this in this time, you know, Elisha um, gave this Syrian guy the orders from the Lord on how he could get healed. The guy went through the process of what the Lord said. He humbled himself and did what the Lord told him to do, and he was healed. So then he was trying to pay Elisha all kinds of money and give him all kinds of stuff, and Elisha said, no, this is, this is the will of the Lord. I'm not taking money for that. This is God's blessing to you. And the, the guy ended up coming into the salvation of faith of the Lord, a Syrian who was probably a Muslim at that time. I know that they had the, the Muslim stuff going on over there in those times. Um, they pretty much converted him to believe in the one true God. So now the servant of Elisha is running after him to take some money for the whole thing. Isolating himself from the protection of the Lord, getting himself into a place where the enemy can attack him and bring destruction in his life through disobedience. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well. And he said, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Lying is another open door to the enemy. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants, and they carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored, him away, stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master, Elisha. I'm sorry, stood before his master. Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, did my heart, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous as white as snow. The devil is constantly trying to get us off course and into an isolated position where he has an open door to access us and steal, kill, and destroy. You step out from underneath the covering of God and you open yourself up to all kinds of calamity, all kinds of struggle, all kinds of strife, curses can come upon you. You have given the enemy open access to your life and to your children's lives. It says descendants as well. We've got to be mindful of this stuff, man. We've got to be mindful. We've got to be sensitive to the spirit. We've got to be serious when we are examining ourselves through and not afraid to hear something that we don't like. It doesn't always sound good to you when the Lord says, your fruit stinks. You need to stop doing this, 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 and this. But know that it's the love of the Father that is trying to protect you, keep you safe, 
and keep you in position for his love to continue to fill you, dress you, and possess you is why he is exposing these things. It's why he can be kind of harsh sometimes because it's serious. It's not a game. It's not about, hey, uh, you know, you got a little something going on here. You may want to think about doing something about it. I, I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything, but, you know, it's, it's probably not a good idea. That's not always going to get your attention. What gets my attention is when he says, hey, listen, dummy, are you serious right now? You know better. Tighten up. Get yourself positioned the way you know I've called you to be positioned and stop playing games. I need that sometimes. I'm sure each one of us need that sometimes because I can blow off that piddly, timid, timid stuff as nothing. But that stuff that comes at me strong, that stuff causes me to think. It, it starts to want to try and get me in the flesh at first. But then I realize my dad loves me and I love him and I want to please him. So I'm going to humble myself and do what he says to do. It, it's as simple as that. You either love him or you don't. The word says, if you love me, you will obey me. Amen? Luke 15. <clears throat> the love of God never fails. <clears throat> and it never gives up on us. He always makes a way of escape. No matter how stupid you've been, no matter how many times you've blown it, no matter what you've done, he's there with open arms waiting for you to cry out to him, ask forgiveness, turn away from what you were doing, and dive into his presence. <clears throat> the devil will tell you the opposite. Tell him to shut up and go back to where he belongs. Because the love of the Father never fails. It never gives up. It will never run out on you. We run out on it. We run out on him. And we allow the enemy to spew a bunch of vomit and take us off course because we grab a hold of the fiery darts that he, that he throws at us. We've got to start cutting that stuff off and listening to what the truth says. He's there for us in everything. I love this story, man. It is a, it's a powerful story. And it's about, I know we've all heard it. If you've ever been to Sunday school, you heard it. <clears throat> Luke 15, start at verse 11. The parable of the lost son. Everybody there? And then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Anybody ever done that? Some of us more than once. <clears throat> and not many days after, wait a minute, where are we at? 14? Yeah, that's it. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. <clears throat> and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. I just want to stop right there for a second. You know, a lot of a lot of times people come in, they get refreshed, they get filled a little bit, and they think they got it. And the enemy starts spewing all kinds of stuff at them. Oh, you're ready. You can get your kids. You can start making money. You can do all this stuff. And it looks great. The picture the enemy tries to paint, it looks phenomenal sometimes. And so then people fall for it, and the next thing they know, they lose everything, and they're starving. And I'm not talking about physically starving, although physically starving may be what's going on as well. But I'm talking about spiritually starving. You get out there and you are miserable. Completely and utterly miserable. 
you're back to the things you used to do. You're living a life of sin and death. You can't stand it. But the amazing and awesome thing is, is God is there waiting for you to repent and come home. So just know that if you make a mistake, humble yourself and come home. Come home to him and let him start you all over again. Cut your losses, which you probably lost everything already anyway, and get positioned with him. Need swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and, and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That is a heart of repentance. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Powerful. Some of us in here, we're here, but there may be things that you have dropped the ball in. There may be things that you know God is exposing in your life that you're in agreement with that you shouldn't be in agreement with. And maybe you've been doing it for a while. Maybe you've come out of it and then gone back to it and come out of it and gone back to it and come out of it and gone back to it. Today is the day to get before him and cry out to him with a true heart of repentance and allow him to move in you mightily and remove the things from you. Take dominion and authority over those things and get rid of them. Because time is running out. It is running out. Take heed to the warning of the Lord. We have got to get purified and sanctified. Does everybody understand how serious it is? This is not a time to play games. This is not a time to mess around. This is not a time to say, oh, I got a little bit of time left. No. Deal with it today. Put it before him today. Cut loose from it today. And stay loose from it. Amen? Do not allow the enemy to get you in a place of isolation where you are out from underneath the covering of the Lord where he can destroy you. All it takes is one little agreement. One thing. You can be right in 50 areas. You're off in that one and it can take you out of position. The devil is not playing games these days. He is looking for that one little thing that he can move you out. And it is happening all around us. We all are seeing it. Amen? Loss of identity or no identity. Lack of assembling. Lack of tithing. Money. Jobs. Relationships. Family. Deaths. The opposite sex. Offense. Disobedience. Not receiving and putting to practice the counsel of the Lord. These are all areas that will bring us into a place of isolation where the enemy has access to our lives. Does everybody understand that? Do I need to read it again? Loss, <laughs> loss of identity or no identity. Lack of assembling. Lack of tithing. Money. Jobs. Relationships. Family. Deaths. The opposite sex, offense, disobedience, not receiving and putting to practice the counsel of the Lord will isolate you and give, give the enemy access to destroy you. Psalms 107. And this is, this is one of the, they're all major. 
but this is, this is critical, man. We have been so blessed to have Pastor Aaron Kate be our spiritual heads. I mean, if you, if you can't see that, I don't know what to tell you. Pray in the spirit more. That's all I can tell you. They have been through it. They have spent the time and continue to spend the time with our Father so that they have the spiritual discernment to give us what we need. Who told you to not listen to what they tell you to do? Who told you to go to them and tell them what you're planning on doing and call that looking for counsel? Wake up. You either want the counsel of the Lord or you don't. That's the bottom line. If you want the counsel of the Lord, you submit yourself to your spiritual authority and you say, what do you think, what do you see? I want to know what God wants. I do not want to step out of God's time. What do you see for me? And here's a kicker. Do what they tell you to do. Something might go right for you in your life. So many times, man, people fall flat on their face. And here's the thing. It may not be the day they refuse the counsel. Maybe a year later. The enemy waits for an opportune time to bring up your disobedience that was not repented for. And you may think things are going good and everything's okay and you're smarter than Pastor and Kate and you're smarter than everybody else and you heard what they had to say but eh, didn't really vibe with you and what you were really thinking the Lord was telling you. So you made your own choice. And things are going pretty decent, you know, Things are moving, you're making money, you're living, you got a place to stay, and then pff, there goes the rug right out from under your feet and you fall flat on your face. There is a way to avoid that. It's called obey the counsel of the Lord. No matter what you think you know, no matter how smart you think you are, if you think that you're smart, you're out of order already. No matter what, you do what it takes to be obedient. That is the bottom line. That is going to save your life. That is going to save your family's life. That is going to save you from misery, from torment, from pain, from bondage, from going back out there and going through the commiserating, terrible nonsense that we've all already been through by just saying amen. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to see it through for the king. You may die a little bit now, but the payoff is going to be phenomenal. You may make it a little while on your own, but the fall is going to be excruciating. Die a little bit now or go through complete and utter misery and maybe not even make it back later. There are many people out there that do not make it back. They refuse the counsel of the Lord, and they don't make it back. This is reality. This is serious. Do whatever it takes. I forgot where we were. Psalms 107. Hallelujah. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Those who sat in darkness and in shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Psalms 33. <clears throat> Psalms 33, 8 through 12. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. 
The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. That means you don't know nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. <clears throat> Luke 16, 1. You know what? I'm sorry. Let's go to Ephesians 5, and we'll close, we'll close there. Ephesians 5, 1. So the counsel of the Lord must be obeyed or you will reap. Hallelujah. Everybody there? Let's read this along because this is going to bring everything together. <clears throat> and confession brings possession. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you, want, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand that the will of the Lord what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And everybody said amen. Hallelujah, Father. We love you and we bless you. We ask that this word today would go forth and bear fruit for your glory, Lord, that nothing would be robbed by the enemy, Lord. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would continue to fill us, dress us, and possess us, expose us, and cause us to take heed to the exposing. No matter what we see, no matter what comes up, Lord, cause us to take action against the enemy, to be obedient so that you can move on our behalf. We know that the house will stand only if you are the center of it and you build it. We commit our lives into your hands, and we thank you for always rescuing us, always saving us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody prepare your hearts for communion and bring up your...